This is Dr. Leslie Allen in his teaching on the book of Ezekiel. This is session number 14, Doom for Egypt, Ezekiel chapter 29, verse 1 through chapter 32, verse 32. We continue our study of this bridge section in the book of Ezekiel by looking at chapters 29 through 32. And these messages are all directed against Egypt. And the first thing to notice is the initial date. Uh, In the 10th month, in the 10th year, in the 10th month, on the 12th day of the uh, uh, month. And for the first time in the book, it backtracks, and it's, it's earlier than the uh, uh, previous one. In 26.1, we had mention of the 11th year, the first day of the month. And so we, we, we've gone back to an, an early year. Um, and in grouping together these messages against uh, Egypt, uh, there's this slight chronological uh, discord. This date, in 29.1, 10, 12, 10, refers to January 587, uh, which was certainly before the fall of Judah's capital. And so it's pre the fall of Jerusalem. And this dating suits the content of the first of the three messages uh, in 29.1 through 16, namely in verses 3 through 6a. And I can say here that the NIV seems to be right in making the start of a new message with the second half of verse 6, because you were a staff of reed to the house of Israel. This functions as an accusation for the the next section, whereas the um, new RSV uh, links it with the uh, first half of verse 6. The oracles against Egypt in general seem to align with Ezekiel's negative pre-fall ministry about the coming downfall of Judah. And we shall have to think through why that is. Well, because they're associated with Judah's hope of deliverance from Babylonian attack by the intervention of the Egyptian army. This was their great hope. And already you may remember back in chapter 17, uh, verses 15 through 17, Ezekiel had spoken uh, out against Zedekiah's negotiations with the Egyptian pharaoh and forecast that no good would come of them. There's a, a fascinating text I've referred to in general before, but now we, we can actually look it up. It's in chapter 37 of Ezekiel and uh, in verse 5. And uh, it tells us that during the siege, during the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem, uh, the hoped-for Egyptian army appeared on the southern Judean borders. And, uh, aha, here at last, the Judean army was turning up. And so the Babylonians besieging Jerusalem um, left Jerusalem, in fact, for a while to to cope with this uh, w- w- with this campaign, a little campaign against Egypt, which uh, evidently was very successful. And um, the Egyptians were repulsed, and uh, the Babylonians came back to besieging Jerusalem, and so. Uh, uh, Judah's last hope was, was gone in that appeal to Egypt, which hadn't materialized with Egyptian success. And in fact, the second message in 6b through 9a is already aware of the failure of this counterattack from Egypt, Judah's ally, as, as we shall see. And so, in principle, the messages against Egypt in chapters 29 to 32, all of them, in fact, they do 
align with Ezekiel's pre-fall ministry. However, when we were looking at um, chapters uh, 25 to 28, we saw that they belonged to his post-fall prophesying. And that may seem strange, that uh, now we've, 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 uh, we've gone, gone back and uh, the two halves of the foreign messages are put in that particular order, post-587, pre-587. We would have um, uh, reversed them so that 29 to 32 followed chapter 24 and chapters 25 to 28 would come just before chapter 33, which represents the turning of the tide and Ezekiel moving to basically positive messages. However, we have noticed that the second edition of the book of Ezekiel uh, has chosen to anticipate good news, and this is what has been happening in chapters 25 to 28. And the arrangement then uh, of of these chapters does align with the structural arrangement, which is a feature of the book as a whole. So, Coming back in in detail, uh, verses 3 to 6a uh, continue the theme of most of chapters 1 through 24. That the 987, the 95, let's get it right, the 597 exiles were wrong in thinking that God was on their side and would soon take them home. But in fact, the worst was going to happen, and their last hope of relief from from Egypt uh, failed uh, during the siege of Jerusalem. And not even this uh, second superpower, which Egypt was uh, in the ancient Near East, not even Egypt could avail against the Babylonians, who were the implicit agents of God's punishment uh, of, of Judah. And here, in this uh, first section, uh, the Pharaoh, it's a message against Pharaoh, a rhetorical message against Pharaoh, uh, while the um, 597 exiles uh, listen. The Pharaoh is characterized as an animal. And there's this metaphor of him being a monster living in the Nile River. And basically, probably a, a crocodile but with overtones of the chaos monster, which uh, sometimes in the Old Testament is called Leviathan. And so this is the contrast here. Pharaoh claims to be master of the uh, Nile domain and even its maker. And uh, the the Nile irrigation, of course, was the the source of Egypt's uh, prosperity. But no, God was going to hunt down this monster and he was going to defeat him and destroy him and his subjects. And so there's an admission that Pharaoh has great power, but God has greater power. And so Egypt will fail. And of course, the second oracle can go on to give solid evidence that Egypt did fail. And verses 6b through 9a come from a little later time after that Egyptian counterattack had failed and the Babylonian army had repulsed them and come back and resumed the siege. And this message is already aware of the failure of the Egyptian attempt to give Judah military support. And his support is ironically called uh, a staff of reed because you were a staff of reed to the house of Israel, a staff no longer than a reed. This is what uh, the Pharaoh is ironically called. Such a tall reed as grew abundantly in the Nile. So we still have strong Nile associations. And that metaphor recalls an earlier time in Judah's history when Judah had uh, also approached Egypt for help Uh, this time against the Assyrians in Hezekiah's reign. And there too, 
Egypt had turned out to be a broken reed. And uh, we, we, we're told that in chapter 36, yes, it is actually 36, um, and in, uh, in, 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 in verse 6, uh, the uh, Assyrian envoy brings a message to Hezekiah, See, you are relying on Egypt, that broken staff of a reed, which will pierce the hand of anyone who leans on it. And then there's, there's another uh, similar message in the book of Isaiah, back in chapter 31, and, uh, and um, verse 1. I'm not sure that, that I've, I've, I've got the right reference. I'll have to check it. Oh, yes. 31.1, alas for those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses and trust in chariots, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel. And so again, this is referring to Hezekiah's policy of trying to get aid from, from Egypt. And in 31.1, the forecast is it's not going to work out. And the Assyrian envoy had say, said the same thing, but spoken of this broken reed. That's how he's going to turn out. And interestingly enough, uh, both of those um, uh, chapters uh, use the word um, uh, uh, lean, and um, this is the um, th- th- this is what the a verb that's going to come up in verse seven. When they leaned on you, you broke and made all their legs un- unsteady. And back in uh, 36, 6, see you are relying on Egypt. In the Hebrew, it's the same verb. You're leaning on Egypt, that broken reed. And then in, in, 30, in 31, uh, you rely on horses. You're relying on Egyptian horses. It's that same verb for leaning. And uh, leaning and relying, it's part of the traditional vocabulary of faith that uh, Hebrew uses uh, in relation to God, but here is there's this alternative faith, and this is what crops up again. This this reed was a, st- a star. It's a staff of reed, and you leaned on it, and uh, it the, the, they leaned on you. The Judeans leaned on you, and uh, you broke, and so there we are. Uh, there's this accusation there Im- implicitly that Judah was doing the wrong thing by turning to Egypt for help. And now the same mistake was, was being made. And so the Pharaoh was to suffer at God's hands and God would use the Babylonian sword to defeat him. The third message is uh, in verses 9 through 16. And this reflects on the two earlier messages and sets them in a wider context. And uh, it speaks of, um, of restoration beyond judgment for Egypt. And this seems to put it in the same category as um, the oracles in the book that re- belong to the uh, post-587 ministry. Uh, this talk of restoration. And uh, there is... And an admission that um, Egypt is going to be restored. Egypt is going to be exiled, and then Egypt is going to be restored, following the same pattern as Judah. Uh, and there's an, this unexpected echo of what was to be Judah's own experience. But it goes on to say, yes, Egypt would survive, but no longer as a political superpower but as a third world country. And in this new uh, case, Egypt would no longer be a temptation to the Judeans, themselves restored from exile, no longer a temptation for Judah to put their military trust in Egypt. And so the Egyptians would be taught an unforgettable lesson that they should not uh, be this, this staff and in alliance, in military alliance with Judah. As I say, this message appears to belong to uh, Ezekiel's post-587 ministry, but it serves to reinforce the theme of his pre-587 prophesying uh, 
and it has the same overall theme of the um, of the of the downfall of uh, Egypt, even as it speaks of restoration. When we reach twenty nine seventeen to twenty one, we are confronted with a number of surprises. First, the date leaps ahead 16 years from the last date to March 571. That's a surprise in itself. And in fact, this is the latest date in the whole book. Uh, Chapter 40 and verse 1 refers to 573, and that otherwise is the latest date. But now we go beyond that to 573 the equivalent of 571. In the 27th year, the first month on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to to me. So that's the first surprise. The second surprise is that its content primarily isn't dealing with Egypt. It's dealing with Tyre. And it's talking about Ezekiel's earlier oracles against Tyre. And Egypt is is brought into this discussion. And in fact, as one reads through this message, it seems to reflect criticism of Ezekiel from the Judean exiles on the grounds that his messages of Tyre's destruction were not fulfilled in the literal way the prophet had described. Now, we said that um, uh, Tyre was besieged. Josephus, uh, the Jewish historian in Roman times, uh, reports a tradition that that siege, the Babylonian siege of Tyre, lasted a very long time, for 13 years presumably uh, from about 586 to 573. And then after so long a campaign, when the troops eventually gained control of the island, those Babylonian troops, they found Tyre's cupboard was bare. Its wealth had been used up over the years, or it had been moved to a safe place, as we might say, to a Swiss bank and certainly away from Tyre. Now, this was very tragic for the Babylonian troops because they depended on looting as part of their wages. And once they got onto the island, they found nothing there. So when they returned home, they complained bitterly. And the Judean exiles heard about this complaint, and they used it as a stick to beat Ezekiel with. And it, it, it really uh, was um, uh, quite serious because it could be used as, as an argument that Ezekiel's prophecies about the future and return to the land and all that good stuff, that would never happen either. And so could you depend on Ezekiel? He'd spoken earlier of false prophets. Well, he's a false prophet himself. And the basis of that uh, accusation is that um, Ezekiel has spoken of looting. The Babylonians would loot Tyre when they conquered it. And we'll look back at those references. But if we think of what the fate of Tyre was, Tyre was conquered, and there's a a Babylonian list of royal hostages dated about 570 that includes the king of Tyre among those royal hostages. And so he was certainly deported like King Jehoiakim of Judah before him. And then we, we also know from Babylonian records about 564, the reigning king of Tyre was replaced by a Babylonian high commissioner. And so Babylon gained complete control of Tyre. 
and ruled it eventually as a, a province, as a Babylonian province with their own officials in charge. But the problem was, Ezekiel had mentioned looting uh, in chapter 26 and verse 5. It shall become plunder for the nations, those foreign contingents who made up the Babylonian army. And then in 26.12, they will plunder your riches and loot your merchandise. There was nothing there. Nothing there. And so Ezekiel was wrong. Was he a false prophet? His critics said so. Well, says the new message here, the Babylonian army will get their perks from Egypt instead as a consolation prize. And indeed, Nebuchadnezzar did invade Egypt in 568, and the campaign may already have been in the air in 571. But was Ezekiel a false prophet? What he'd said didn't literally come true. And perhaps we can surmise that rhetorical embellishment can play a part in a prophetic message to lend emotional support uh, to, to that message, to its general theme. And as a parallel, perhaps we can compare Jeremiah 50 through 51, a long pair of messages against Babylon. Babylon is going to be destroyed. Well, in actual fact, in 539, Cyrus' army quietly took over the city and were welcomed by its citizens who were fed up by their present ruler. But Babylon certainly lost its imperial power with Cyrus's takeover. And so, in a very real way, those oracles were, were true, but with the rhetorical embellishment as it turned out, because the destruction never happened, only a peaceful takeover. And this message, it just admits that the looting didn't happen uh, and that the disgruntled army would get an alternative opportunity. There are two messages here, a public one in 15 to 20 and a private one to Ezekiel in verse 21. And that private message in verse, in verse 21 uh, is a a pastoral reassurance to the prophet that expresses God's concern for Ezekiel in in his embarrassment. On that day I will cause a, a horn to sprout up for the house of Israel, and I will open your lips among them, then they shall know that I am the the, the Lord. The uh, horn uh, speaks of of prosperity and, and honor for the house of Israel. Those positive messages are going to come true, and uh, and also, uh, in your prophetic ministry, I'm going to uh, open your, your your lips. And this doesn't seem here to be a, a reference to that um, the ending of that old symbolic action, but it refers to the confidence that God would enable the prophet to to have through the fulfilment of his messages. He can trust God that those positive messages are going to be fulfilled. But God's destructive work against Egypt through the Babylonians was the precursor of salvation for his people. The exiles would eventually be restored and be rehabilitated. We come now to chapter 30 and the collection of messages in chapter 30, 1 through 19, the whole chapter, they've been put together into one literary grouping. And it, it's reasonable to, to suppose that we re- return now to the earlier period of, the, of, that, um, of, of those earlier messages, uh, pre-587. And the implicit lesson is that the exiles' hopes that Egypt would decisively drive the Babylonian army away from besieged Jerusalem would not materialize. We come back to that theme again. Instead, this day of the Lord would overwhelm uh, Egypt. 
And we have use of that prophetic theme of the day of the Lord. Wail, alas for the day, 31, 2. Verse 3, for a day is near, the day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds, a time of doom. A sword shall come upon Egypt. And this is picking up and using a a prophetic motif, uh, which often occurs in, uh, or at least sometimes occurs in, articles of judgment against, uh, against Judah and against the northern kingdom. But in this case, it's transferred, and Egypt is going to be the victim of that day of the Lord when Yahweh intervenes in a hostile way. And in chapter 7, we, we, we may remember that um, Ezekiel picked up that theme of the day of the Lord and applied it against Judah. And now it's redirected against Egypt. And so from Judah's point of view, it's going to be, uh, it's, it's uh, g- g- going to endorse the, the judgment of, uh, of um, both Egypt and Judah. Egypt's allied troops are listed in verse 5, including Judean mercenaries, which is interesting. Uh, There was was a settlement right in the south of of Egypt called Elephantini, uh, and uh, it it was at the southern border, and it it was a military fortress defending from attack from the south. And it was largely made up of Jewish mercenaries, and and we have preserved uh, correspondence uh, from Elephantini to to Jerusalem and to Persia in the post-exilic period. And here now, there were Judean mercenaries, evidently. And this comes out more clearly in the NIV in verse 5, which speak of the people of the covenant land as among the mercenary troops that uh, Egypt had. Verses 10 to 12 are a second message of judgment that serves to explain uh, the sword, a sword is mentioned in verse 4. A sword shall come upon uh, Egypt. And this is, uh, this is now explained at greater length. It's explained in, in historical uh, terms uh, as Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, I will put a hand to the hordes of Egypt, verse 10, by the hand of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. He and his people with them, the most terrible of the nations. Because it wasn't only Babylonian troops, the Babylonians too had their their allies, their imperial allies, um, vassal troops from the various nations that made up the Babylonian Empire. And then verses 13 through 19 enumerate one by one the Egyptian cities that would suffer and be overwhelmed. And these messages express uh, emotional vehemence to induce the exiles to accept an unwelcome truth. Egypt would prove that prove to be no good friend of Judah. The message in 30 uh, verses 20 through 26 has its own date. Uh, the 11th year, the first month, the seventh year of the month. And that is uh, uh, two months later than the initial date in 29.1. And time has moved on. And it's now March 587. And we're still in siege time. Uh, but there's been an important development, uh, which we've already spoken of in an earlier oracle, that now, in fact, the Babylonians had driven back the Egyptian army that had come to Jerusalem's aid. So now the siege would be resumed. And so here again, the exile's last hopes had been dashed. And the news is given a a theological interpretation in God's private message to uh, Ezekiel in verse uh, 21. Mortal, I have broken the arm of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. It has not been bound up for healing, or wrapped with a bandage so that it may become strong to wield the sword. And so there's this strong and effective repulsing of the Egyptian attempt to uh, lift the the Babylonian uh, siege. God had decisively broken Pharaoh's arm, as it were, uh, beyond mending so that he was unable to fight. 
And this news warrants a public message which is uh, set out in verses uh, 22 to 26 that in the future uh, lay another attack from the Babylonians against Egypt, a double attack in verse 22. I am against Pharaoh, king of Egypt. I will break his arms, both the strong arm and the one that was broken, and I will make the sword fall from his hand. That's those are, 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 are that's a difficult sentiment to understand, and so the suggestion has been made, and it seems quite plausible, that there's mention here of two campaigns against Egypt, uh, one from the land and one from the sea, and in both cases they would uh, they would be victorious and uh, break again Pharaoh's broken arm, but but then also defeat his not only his land forces but also uh, Pharaoh's uh, sea fleet. And Nebuchadnezzar was going to be God's, uh, God's swordsman, it goes on to say. Uh, the, king, the king of Babylon is going to wield uh, God's sword. And so it, it, Nebuchadnezzar did campaign against Egypt uh, in 568, but it, it, it doesn't seem to have been a, a, a very strong uh, campaign. It, it doesn't seem to have uh, re- resulted in invasion of uh, Egypt, for instance. And so it, it doesn't seem to uh, to, to fit uh, the, this message here or the uh, uh, previous ones that spoke of Nebuchadnezzar's defeat of Egypt. And uh, it may be that Ezekiel had a, an intuition, a foreboding concerning the Persian king Cambyses, who brutally conquered Egypt in 525 BC. But anyway, his messages in this chapter represent a loud, repeated no to the hopes of his fellow exiles. There could be no quick solution to their problems, no easy exit from them, such as Egyptian military support might have provided. God's will did not lie in that direction. We come to chapter 31, and now there is a new date. Uh, The 11th year, the third month on the first day of the uh, month. Uh, We may have noticed that we, we have a proliferation of dating uh, in these foreign oracles, which is contrary to that structural pattern that we found earlier on, where decisive parts of the book were differentiated in ongoing sequence of dates. But there's a different pattern uh, in in all the in, in this excitement uh, of, of of the siege of Jerusalem, uh, Egypt. Um, is very much in people's minds. And Ezekiel is giving a whole series of of messages uh, to do with the uh, uh, siege. And so there's this this different practice here of giving quite a number. And this is uh, two months further on from the uh, date of 3020. We've now reached May 587, and this is still siege time. We have uh, uh, three smaller but closely related messages grouped together uh, here in in 31 uh, in um, verses 1 to 18. It's verses 2 to 9, 10 to 14, and then 15 to 18. Now, I I have a, a, a problem in verse 3. It says, consider Assyria, a cedar of Lebanon and talking about Assyria, and talking about Assyria falling, and then contrasting it with Egypt. Well, uh, is that right? And a number of commentators are a bit unhappy about a mention of Assyria here, and would prefer a reference to a, a very similar Hebrew word, which refers to a huge tree along with a cedar of Lebanon. And the question is, in resolving this problem or trying to, what is the meaning of the the question in verse 2? Whom are you like? 
in your greatness? Is this a true question that's seeking information? And then it goes on, well, perhaps Assyria. Perhaps you were as great as Assyria was, but of course Assyria fell. And so if it's a real question, uh, Assyria fits in very well. And in the, our traditional Hebrew text, Assyria assumes that the question in verse 2 is not a rhetorical one, which doesn't expect an, an answer, uh, but it's, a historic, it's one that invites a historical reference. So which is it? Is it a rhetorical question or a, or a real question that expects an answer? And the interesting thing is that there is a pickup of the question in verse 18. Which among the trees of Eden was like you in glory and greatness? And that's a rhetorical question. That's a rhetorical question. And it suggests that this is a, that, that, that this is a rhetorical here. That Egypt is incomparable. Egypt is incomparable. Egypt is the greatest. And then we move to a metaphor. The exploring of a metaphor. Metaphor, talking about a great tree, which is also incomparable. And so there's an illustration of Egypt's incomparability uh, with this tree. And this brings in a theme which was very popular in the ancient Near East of a cosmic tree. The, the, the world, the earth was regarded as a, as a great tree. And um, it, it towered up into uh, heaven, and its roots were in the subterranean waters. This enormous tree was what the world represented. And now that this is a metaphor illustrating the incomparability, I'll tell you about something incomparable. But are you really like that? Are you really like that? Because this tree, which sounds in, uh, incomparable and so likely to last forever, as Ezekiel explores the metaphor, it's destroyed. It's destroyed. And so there's a, there's a turning on its head, this metaphor of the cosmic tree. And there is, um, th- 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 there is a mention as we go through this of a uh, vital uh, factor uh, in in verse eight, uh, it mentions the cedars in the garden of God that couldn't rival it, nor the fir trees equal its boughs. The plane trees were as nothing compared with its branches. No tree in the garden of God was like it in beautiful in beauty. I made it beautiful, verse nine, with its mass. Of branches, the envy of all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God. So we get a mixture of this metaphor of this great tree with this other idea of the garden of Eden with its beautiful trees. And the vital thing is God created those trees and God created that great tree which in the metaphor represents Egypt. And so that makes all the difference. And so, although it's incomparable and and though it seems to be eternal and everlasting, it's God's creation. And so the will of God is going to prevail against it. There's this new vital fact over against all its power and all its uh, enduring strength. And so we have to think again. It's incomparable. Yes, we admit that. Yes, it's a superpower. Yes, it's so powerful. But... uh, It's in God's garden. It's in God's garden. If God wants, he can chop it down. He can chop it down. And uh, and so there we are. There's this, the metaphor is given a twist. And uh, Egypt, like the cosmic tree, with all its achievements and all its power, is going to come crashing down to the ground because God so wills there's going to be judgment against it in, in, in point of fact. And in verses 10 through 14, the, the, this tree is openly equated with, with Egypt by the 
uh, reference to um, the references to the Babylonian defeat of the Egyptian army that had come to try to come to Judah's defense. So this this height of the tree uh, in verse ten, this enormous tree, it, it's it's regarded as representing the pride of Egypt. Uh, the going it alone, the self-sufficiency of Egypt. And this is very much uh, now the, an accusation which is the cause for the downfall of the Egyptian tree. And so that height of the tree becomes a symbol of uh, Egyptian uh, high and mighty pride. And now the tree has been, is going to be chopped down and it's going to litter the ground with its now lifeless branches. That's going to be the end of Egypt. Now, it's talking of it as a, as a, an, in a past tense, about the, uh, the Egyptian tree dying and going down to, to the underworld. In, in verses 11 through, uh, to, through 12, it's referring back to that Babylonian defeat of the Egyptian army. Uh, but is that what it means? Is that what it means? Are the references what it means? And it may well be a funeral lament. This oracle of judgment may well be a funeral lament. It isn't announced as such at the beginning of chapter 31, but if it's a funeral lament, then you put in a past tense what is going to happen. And we saw that illustrated at the beginning of Amos uh, chapter 5. Uh, and um, Ezekiel uh, d- does seem to, 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 to have in view uh, the, uh, the defeat caused by a Babylonian army in the future, in a very certain future. And what makes one think like that is that there seems to be an envisioning of Egyptian exile. And that certainly didn't fit what uh, the Babylonians were able to do in their attack on Egypt in in 582. Uh, This is a much more forceful campaign here. But the end of verse 11, I have cast it out. I have cast it out. It seems to refer to an exile of uh, Egypt. And so this seems to be looking uh, uh, forward uh, beyond uh, 582, in fact, which didn't do that. And certainly, in, in 15 to, to, to 18, uh, we have a funeral lament evoked uh, in, in the language of this uh, third, third, third message, 15 to 18. God orders mourning rituals for the dead Egypt. And past... Uh, national powers uh, are already down there languishing in the underworld and we're told that they're gratified that their powerful survivor has been toppled at last. Egypt has uh, joined them. And then verse verse 18 uh, refers to the direct address of verse 2 addressing the uh, Pharaoh, referring to Pharaoh with his army and it closes with a a plain third-person interpretation. This is Pharaoh and all his horde, says the Lord. And basically, Ezekiel is still coping with the optimism of his fellow prisoners of war. They were still hoping for the Babylonian uh, threat to Jerusalem to go away. They were pinning those hopes on Egypt. And the prophet... uh, admits that there were good grounds for the optimism. Egypt was indeed a military power to reckon with, and yet the exiled had reckoned without God, the exiles had reckoned without God's purposes, punitive purposes that used Nebuchadnezzar as his agent and removed all obstacles that stood in the way. The Pharaoh, with his incomparable power, would finally meet his match in the one who had the power of life and death. God himself. Chapter 32 is the uh, closing chapter of these foreign messages and it still needs to deal with Egypt. Uh, 
And verses 1 through uh, 16 is uh, a grouping of, um, of shorter messages, four shorter messages, 3 to 8, 9 to 10, 11 to 14, 15 to 16, all directed still against Egypt. And they're called, collectively, a lamentation. We, we, we do have this uh, formal designation in verse 2. Raise a lamentation against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say to him as follows. And uh, in verse 16, at the end, we also have uh, reference to a lamentation. This is a lamentation. It shall be chanted. The women of the nations shall chant it. Over Egypt and all its hordes, they shall chant it, says the Lord. So here we have this lamentation, which actually, of course, is an oracle of judgment. Uh, And in the course of the uh, message, it reads actually more like a plain oracle of judgment. But uh, in verses 7 and 8, it calls for mourning. Uh, in the sky, the morn should sky, the, the, the sky should mourn for, um, for Egypt. Verse 8, all the shining lights of the heavens I will darken above you and put darkness in, in your land. And then, uh, and, and then it, um, it, um, it goes on to uh, say in, in, in the first part of 9, I will trouble the hearts of many peoples. And this too is, is, is mourning on behalf of the great nation of Egypt. But apart from that, it's mainly a plain oracle of judgment. But there's a new date uh, at the beginning of chapter 32. And uh, this is March 585. And um, Jerusalem had fallen by now. 587 was, was over. Uh, Jerusalem had fallen, and the uh, prisoners of war uh, must have been informed of that fact by now. Uh, Yet, in in substance, verses 1 to 6 read like a reissue of 29, 3 to 6, which were designed to counter hopes that Egypt would come to Jerusalem's rescue. And you get the impression that even after the fall of Jerusalem, there were some prisoners of war who said, aha, aha, Uh, We hope that Egypt won't tolerate the Babylonians' control of Palestine and Syria. We hope that they will mount a a massive counterattack. And so if that's that's true, then even though the siege was over and Jerusalem had fallen, uh, they were still pinning their hopes that Egypt might intervene at this very, very last stage. We don't know. The message begins in verse 2 by referring to the Pharaoh as a lion, king of the international jungle. Yes, a power to reckon with. But then it develops a second comparison, a crocodile in the Nile, but a crocodile larger than life. It's the chaos monster again. And this combination, crocodile, chaos monster, chaos monster was one we had in an earlier oracle against Egypt. And over against such power, God's role was to be the hunter, hunting down this beast and spreading its lifeless, massive carcass over mountains and valleys. The message identifies God's hunting of the Egyptian monster with an attack by Nebuchadnezzar uh, on uh, Egypt. He's going to be God's uh, agent. The text is looking forward to a a further attack on Egypt, a devastating attack. And then in verse 17, we come to this this next oracle, 17 to 32, bringing us to the end of the Egyptian messages and the end of the uh, messages against the foreign nations. And this is a judgment oracle against uh, Egypt's military power. No uh, months supplied here. It's in the 12th year, uh, in the um, 
Yes. If, if, if you look at the uh, new RSV, it does supply a month. In the 12th year, in the first month, on the 15th day of the month, but there's a footnote, the Hebrew text doesn't have a reference to the month, and it's imported from the uh, Septuagint. And uh, that's probably an easier reading. That's a scribal uh, revision, uh, which is very nice, but it doesn't, uh, it's not part of the original uh, text, in in, in fact. But it, it's a correct interpretation because it, it, it seems to be the, the uh, uh, in, in 32, now, now, no, in 32 verse 1, the 12th year and the 12th months, and here in the 12th year in the uh, first months, well, going, going way, way back, I, I don't know why, why the Septuagint should have done that. Uh, but um, it um, the we 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 seem to be in we are in five at five uh, five eight five but probably seemingly uh, later and this final message against uh, uh, Egypt envisions the final defeat of the Egyptian army it portrays that defeat in terms of death and going down to the underworld, which was a note we, we had earlier where Egypt was concerned. And the, the message contrasts an honorable burial and a place of honor in the underworld with the fate of two other groups, uh, uncircumcised people and people who died a violent death uh, by the sword. It was believed that they went to a, a lower and dishonorable place in the underworld. And this idea seems to be picked up, and Egypt is going to be put in this worse place, and not in a place of, of uh, honor. And uh, so their fate, this fate, was evidently to be allocated of this separate shameful place in the underworld. This was in store for Egypt. And another feature of this message is that Egypt is set along other nations who had once exercised great power. And there's a, there's a list of them enumerated. But they were now only empty memories, just museum pieces. And there's mention of Assyria down in the underworld. Uh, Assyria had once ruled the ancient Near East, but now no longer. There's mention of Elam, east of Babylon. Uh, which had once ruled southern Mesopotamia until driven out by Assyria. There's mention of Meshech Tubal, southeast of the Dead Sea, which had once been a serious threat to Assyria in the 8th century BC. But all these were has-beens. All these were uh, now of military importance only to the historian, like France under Napoleon or Germany under Hitler. And so Egypt's going to take its, that place, important no longer, just of interest to the historian, and nothing more. And then a few other nations are listed in verses 29 and 30, but now from a Palestinian perspective rather than from a Babylonian one. Glancing back over the, those foreign messages, we need to notice an increasing preoccupation with death and the underworld. It's been cropping up over and over again in 26 uh, to 28, 31, and finally reiterated loud and long in chapter 32. And there's this morbid preoccupation with the fate of the foreign nations as involving the underworld. And this morbid preoccupation has an important structural role in the book because it aligns with the general tenor of uh, Ezekiel's negative messages for for Judah, Judah in exile, going through a death-like experience even now. Uh, This negativity, it, it comes to a head in this speaking of death and the underworld. And it's important that it's stressed now because we're going to be moving on And we're going to be moving on to a a preoccupation with life, life and living 
is going to be a key word from chapters 33 onwards. And so we have this polarization of death and life. And now life is going to take over from all that talk of death we've had uh, implied or expressed in those earlier chapters. Next time, we should be studying chapter 33. This is Dr. Leslie Allen in his teaching on the book of Ezekiel. This is session number 14, Doom for Egypt, Ezekiel chapter 29, verse 1 through chapter 32, verse 32.